Okay. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for everybody coming. And, uh, this is our second meeting for the three towns. And um, the purpose is to um, make sure we keep the communications open and see what we can do to keep working towards, you know, making it easier for all three towns. And what we can do is, uh, is uh, I've invited uh, Garrett Corbin from MMA here to discuss some of the legislative issues that he sees and the MMA sees coming up. It's uh, going to be a very informal meeting. And uh, if you have questions, just jump in. We'll uh, handle them as they come. And um, I will have us go around and introduce people. We are being recorded. And uh, Borough Community TV will be putting it up and uh, putting it out on the, on the Facebook and uh, YouTube. So and, uh, I'm Tom Wright, Chairman of the Borough. Selectman. Steve Elders, Town Manager of Berwick. Garrett Corbin, Legislative Advocate, Maine Municipal Association. Um, Jonathan Hall, and I'm currently the Chair of the North Berwick Board of Selectmen. Uh, Charles Galamo, North Berwick Board of Selectmen. Dwayne Moore, Town Manager of North Berwick. Mike Johnson, Selectman of North Berwick. Wendy Callan, Vice Chair of the North Berwick Board of Selectmen. Paul Philbert, North Berwick Selectman. Laura Bryant, Vice Chair, Lebanon Selectman. Uh, Chip Arnold, Lebanon Selectman. Uh, Nancy Newbert, School Board Chair. Beth O'Connor, State Representative, Berwick and North Berwick. Um, is, I'm going to turn it over to, to Garrett, and you can jump right in with uh, his uh, presentation, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, great. Well, as you mentioned, um, if, if the meeting is going to be informal, I think I'll, I'll try to be informal as well, and I'll just uh, explain a little bit about uh, how MMA works uh, from a legislative perspective and uh, open up to questions and see if I can just um, answer questions that come up. But again, uh, I am a legislative advocate in MMA's state and federal relations department. Uh, it's a department of four. Uh, we have uh, uh, the director of the department, Kate Dufour. Uh, our, uh, my colleague Rebecca Graham, and then she's also a legislative advocate, and then Laura Ellis is the uh, administrative assistant uh, at uh, what we call SFR at MMA. Um, and so uh, I can explain a little bit more about how Maine Municipal works in general, uh, other departments, but uh, our department is uh, in charge of going to the State House, uh, advocating on behalf of municipal interests, and then also um, advocating for municipalities before. Um, executive agencies um, in state government. So that's uh, what we're busy with uh, in this off session when the legislature's out, um, off season, uh, so to speak. We, um, the positions that MMA takes on any one piece of legislation or policy uh, rule proposal are not up to um, the four people in my department. They're uh, determined by a 70 member legislative policy committee that we have that's made up of two municipal officials elected by their peers from each of the state's 35 Senate districts. So uh, we get a really good, I, in my view, mix of um, perspectives from uh, you know some of the largest cities to some of the smallest towns, um, all walks of life, all, um, all uh, you know, political perspectives. Of course, local government by and large is not um, partisan. So um, when our legislative policy committee meets, um, they, uh, um, a lot of uh, policy discussions are had, but uh, I've, I've been with MMA for five years and I couldn't tell you uh, which, where on the spectrum many of these officials fall. Um, it's, a, it's a really good um, nonpartisan discussion in the base that, that they have. They meet um, usually about one, once a month during the legislative session. Uh, which, uh, you know, the, the longer session years runs from January or, or late December through till uh, June or so. Sometimes the last few years have been a little bit longer. Uh, the short session, uh, so-called, uh, usually runs from January till May or so this year. Uh, we just got out uh, recently. And, um, and so then uh, when the legislature's out, um, usually uh, the years between the first and second legislative session our policy committee uh, usually takes a break and does not meet unless there's some uh, major emergency type issue. But we can communicate with them uh, through email. We'll do polling surveys. Um, otherwise, in the years leading up to um, every other year, uh, the uh, general election that we're about to have, 
uh, when the new legislature is coming in, our legislative policy committee will meet a few times. Uh, this year it's three times. Maybe one more meeting as needed, but I think we'll do it in, in three times two form uh, MMA legislative platform. And that is the uh, bills that MMA is going to advance uh, to try to address some of the major municipal concerns statewide. Uh, and then uh, throughout, uh, so the, the last legislative session, I think there were about 10 bills on our platform, uh, ranging from major issues like revenue sharing all the way down to minor legal housekeeping type uh, technical issues. <clears throat> and then um, we'll take, of course, uh, as bills are printed and become publicly available, we review all of them. Uh, there's a few thousand bills printed each session. MMA, uh, on average, uh, from what I've seen, takes a position on just about a third of them um, uh, because just so many different policy proposals have legislative tentacles that will trickle down to uh, the local level. So, uh, so we wind up uh, then submitting testimony, um, usually in person, sometimes if we're spread thin, uh, uh, we'll, we'll just submit written testimony on some of the bills, but uh, we'll submit testimony on uh, hundreds of bills each session and, uh, and then go from there. So, um, so there's a difference between our, our platform bills and, uh, and then also the, uh, the bills that we just take a position on uh, that other people submit. Uh, there are 17 or 18 committees at the legislature. Uh, so the three uh, advocates, um, Kate, Rebecca, and myself, each cover uh, six or so committees each session, a uh, wide variety of topics. The ones on my plate are energy, utilities, and technology, where I've got, had the chance to work with Beth um, the last few years, which has been great. Um, energy, utilities, technology, judiciary, state and local government, veterans and legal affairs, uh, and uh, what am I missing? Marijuana Legalization and Implementation Committee has been on my plate uh, the last uh, couple of years. And then I was covering medical marijuana before the Health and Human Services Committee as well. In the past, I've also covered the Environment uh, and Natural Resources Committee and Transportation Committee and uh, Labor Committee. So I've got some know-how uh, in, in all of those areas. Um, the, I, I have not covered uh, really the major healthcare policies, uh, education committee or taxation. Uh, those have been in my boss's wheelhouse. So, if questions come up tonight on those topics, I'll probably have to defer and get back to you. Um, but uh, the ones you know in my realm, uh, hopefully, I've got sufficient experience to be able to address some questions. Um, because our legislative policy committee is still working on developing its platform, it's not public. Uh, once it is finalized, we'll, we'll make it public, and um, probably one of the most transparent and public organizations in Augusta, in my view. Um, we put everything out uh, through our, uh, we have a magazine, a monthly magazine, Main Town and City, that goes out every month. Uh, and, and so we usually do a legislative preview in the December edition and then a legislative wrap up in the July or August edition, uh, summarizing what happened. So in December, uh, I, hopefully our platform will be published in that. Um, it'll make the, the deadline for publication in that. and then. Weekly during the legislative session, we also do our legislative bulletin that gets distributed to all of our members. It's available for free for the public on our website. Uh, MMA's website is memun.org, uh, memun for municipal. Um, and then uh, we've got our own legislative advocacy section on that. Um, I also added a new section this year because marijuana has been such a hot topic. Um, so there's a marijuana resources page that's up and, and has all of the information we put out on that topic and we're considering adding some other ones um, for, uh, for uh, you know, cutting edge type uh, issues uh, as needed. So we've got our monthly publication, we've got our legislative bulletin that's on our website uh, that goes out during session every week. And, uh, and that's about it for the written publication. Uh, aside from our testimony. Is, is, uh, I'll just put a plug in, you mentioned earlier that is, uh, there's one position open on the Legislative Policy Commission. Great, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, we've actually got two since, since this is a, a mix of uh, towns in Senate District 34 and 35, so we've got, it looks like part of our work is in each of those two Senate right. districts. And then um, Lebanon's in uh, 34, 
and South Park looks at 35, so we have one vacancy. North of or, oh, okay, excuse North me. North, North, okay, <laughs> sorry. Got a list here. Um, wrong list, I guess. So either way, we've got a vacancy in each uh, um, district, so if there's anyone interested. Um, normally, there's a there's a uh, election um, process where uh, the municipal officials will um, submit a ballot uh, or uh, answer a ballot for who they like um, to vote for uh, if it's a contested race. Sometimes we have races that are not contested, um, and then of course you have times when uh, a few instances throughout the state when we don't get any candidates, like is the case for these two districts. Uh, we had one candidate or one um, vacancy in each district out of the two slots. So um, now that the elections have happened, if anyone, any municipal official is interested, uh, you could uh, um, basically you could contact uh, Laura Ellis is the assistant in my department. Uh, she could get a message to MMA um, who, who fills that vacancy after the election is up to uh, the president of the association who right now um, the president for MMA and the executive committee at MMA, which is separate from our legislative committee, is Linda Cohen. She's the mayor of South Portland, longtime um, clerk. She's uh, won a lot of municipal hats, as many municipal officials tend to do. She will be um, retiring from at least South of her current role in South Portland uh, in December, and then uh, um, her position is going to be filled by the vice president. Um, President-elect is Mary Sabins, who's the uh, manager for the town of Basselboro. Um, and I could explain our executive committee a little bit more if anyone has questions. But so so I uh, strongly encourage you to, to join. It is, uh, you know, I know it's a drive. Um, I'm from Bangor, which is about as far from here as Northern Maine is to Bangor. Um, but, uh, the uh, uh, you know for the once a month uh, if if you were to consider um, joining I know uh, Tom has served in the past and you could probably speak to what the conversations are like but they're really um, in my view rich and substantive and they um, agree to disagree they're very collegial um, when there are disagreements a lot of time everyone's on the same page which really says something if municipal officials from you know uh, from here to Caribou uh, see something uh, similarly then then that sends a strong message, I think. And, uh, and then uh, when they disagree, um, you know, sometimes we won't take a position if it just divides municipal membership, um, then we'll take no position on a proposal. But otherwise, um, uh, a lot of the time we'll start somewhere and end up in a different place and um, find compromise just through the course of a meeting. So it's much like a town uh, meeting of town meeting officials, uh, really. So. Uh, I've probably blabbed long enough. Any, any questions for me at this point? Um, you mentioned that last session you, the MMA had uh, 10 specific bills that you would propose. Is, how successful were you in uh, getting those passed? Good question. The, uh, the housekeeping ones uh, went through all right. Uh, on the, the, but the major success that was documented in our, um, I think it was in July, the July in town Main Town and City Magazine um, covered uh, most of the legislative session with the exception of this special session that ran in August and September. Um, no. <laughs> and, and, and our major, uh, <laughs> not her fault. So, I, so that um, um, the, the sort of summary that um, uh, Kate, the director, wrote was. Um, uh, saw it as a, a lot of, uh, uh, we fell short, frankly, on a lot of our um, initiatives. Um, there was, a, you know, stalemate is probably, uh, given the divide in the legislature, uh, um, a lot of proposals didn't make it very far. Um, and, and that was the case, uh, not just for MMA's proposals, but other organizations as well. Uh, we we uh, generally had a step forward on marijuana policy. Uh, we were looking for strong local control there. Uh, and so um, what came out ultimately was this opt-in um, provision that, uh, for the commercial side of the marijuana businesses, same with uh, medical uh, to a, a good extent. Um, it would be up to the municipality to just decide whether or not it wants to allow the commercial operations in their borders. Uh, the personal side of it is a little bit different because um, that, that's more of a right than a commercially licensed privilege. Uh, so there's you know rules that um, for personal consumption and cultivation that's that's allowed everywhere, but for the commercial side, the business aspect, 
um, now towns can, um, can it, it's essentially um, a moratorium until the town decides to allow it. The, where we fell short on that was um, uh, the initial proposal that was approved at referendum in the fall of 2016 uh, had municipalities getting a strong share of the application licensing fees that the state collected. Um, that was removed from the bill, as was any provision for revenue sharing. So basically, I'm calling it um, all of the uh, home rule with none of the revenue. So uh, that, that's um, may make the cut for our platform next year is looking for revenue. And, and um, you know, speaking of our platform, I guess looking forward, again, we're, we're going to have one more meeting in November to finalize our platform. Um, so I wouldn't uh, probably don't want to get too far into the details right now because they're still in flux. But uh, it's largely a fiscal focus, um, as might be expected. So uh, revenue sharing, it looks like, will be uh, probably top of the list. Um, you know, for decades, uh, the, the state shared 5% of the sales and excise taxes collected um, with uh, municipalities. And for the better part of the last decade, um, it's been uh, over, yeah, probably three uh, um, administrations in Augusta, it's been rated or cut, and so right now it's at 2% uh, rather than 5% um, by law, it's scheduled to ramp back up to 5%. Uh, it looks like we'll be um, trying to make sure that happens. Um, <clears throat> the other areas where there are costs, you know, uh, the, the state not funding 55% of education, they, they got further this session, I'd say, than they have in the past, uh, to their credit, but it's still not uh, quite where um, with where in our view it should be under the law. So um, looking for funding for that. Uh, sustained funding for county jails has been an issue. The state wound up funding county jails, but it was, I'd say, a pretty close call. Um, that wasn't settled until the end of session. So um, MMA's perspective is that the property taxes pay about 80% of the jail costs, uh, roughly. And, uh, and it's state policy um, that gets people, you know, uh, the state sets the crimes um, and, and prosecutes, and, uh, or at least the counties do. And, um, so that matter of policy, in our view, should be uh, more of a balanced share of costs. And, uh, and so we've tried to make sure the state pays more and that more of those kind of jail costs don't fall on, um, on local property taxes. So, um, so that's something uh, we'll probably be working on as well. Um, uh, we're also doing something this year. It looks like we'll be um, just adopting some themes as part of the platform rather than specific bills um, that will uh, just guide us when bills come up uh, on, on that theme topic. So uh, one would be the workforce. Um, you know, aging means aging populace, and, and the workforce is an issue that I think affects not just municipalities, uh, all sectors. So uh, it doesn't look right now like MMA, MMA will be advancing bills to deal with the workforce issue, but when bills come up and proposals are put forward by other entities, uh, we'll likely um, you know, uh, weigh the merits of those and decide whether and how to support them. Um, same thing goes with the opioid issue, uh, serious municipal concern, but it's also a concern of, of all different kinds of entities. So. Uh, will probably be supportive of efforts, um, but but not necessarily putting forward a specific approach um, to deal with that. We'll weigh what other people, other experts uh, have to say and put forward on that issue. Tom, question: I mean, you talked about uh, medical marijuana and, and adult use marijuana. We're in the midst of working on our on, on what we're doing in North Berwick. And interested to find out what Berwick and Lebanon are doing as it relates to at least medical marijuana. Of course, adult use marijuana is not been really the rules and regulations most probably according to today's paper. It looks like fall of next year uh, when the rules and regulations are going to be promulgated. Uh, but what are you guys doing for medical you marijuana? Stealing my topic for the next okay. order. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the past two weeks, I've been writing ordinances as it relates to medical marijuana. So, and I, the past we don't have any until we got and the past three days, basically, for the past 36 hours, that's all I've been writing. So it's fresh in my mind. Uh, so just interested to find out what what are you guys looking at for medical marijuana? Are you guys going to opt in for any of the land uses that are existing? Or are you guys going to not opt in? Has Berwick, have you guys just taught any discussion? We have several um, production facilities for medical marijuana. We have four in uh, Berwick, um, one larger than the other three. 
Um, and we have a uh, amendment to the ordinance uh, coming uh, in November to regulate where they can go and also outlets for uh, selling the products. So you're looking at retail stores as well? Um, we also, we've been working on the recreational one and uh, as soon as the state uh, gets the regulations that will be prepared to plug in whatever those are. Um, Berwick, uh, at first we had a, a moratorium until we had a chance to work on it. We talked, the board talked about uh, not allowing uh, recreational marijuana in the community, but Berwick was one of the towns that actually supported that. Uh, so they came back to the table and then said, well, the citizens here really did support that. I'm not sure what the margin was, but... It was substantial. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they decided to put together something as soon as we know what the regulations will be, and we will allow it. We're just trying to control where it goes, I think. And, yeah, and that's basically what our product is right now. We're not looking at adult use right now. We're just really looking at medical, the medical side. And uh, so we had yeah, a four and a half hour meeting a couple of weeks ago where we kind of hashed things around. And we're, we're, we're in the same boat where we're allowed. Or at least we're going to put forward to our voters some, some land use um, um, amendments to our ordinance to, to allow for some of those uses within our and opt into some of those uses. Uh, limited retail stores, we're going to limit to one, or at least that's what's being bantered around currently. Um, allow for cultivation facilities, but limiting their size uh, to 2,500 square feet, uh, plus a whole host of other, a uh, whole host of other uh, Conditions. Well, it's also zoning. I mean, we also discussed at length, you know, which, you know, <coughs> Where zones in the town, right. uh, those will be allowed. Yeah, we, we've had one, the larger facility, we had some real odor control issues. Mm -hmm. And part of the permitting process, he was supposed to uh, control that better. Yeah. Uh, and um, he had to come back to the planning board for something else, and uh, they made sure that he beefed it up. And, uh, I mean, the key right. issues that we're looking at, of course, are one of the things is odor. Um, Sanford has a, a really good ordinance as it relates to odor and marijuana. So if you're looking for uh, to borrow uh, from, a, from a community, they've done, they've, they have some really good odor controls. Um, security, of course, is another concern. Um, locations next to sensitive areas, you know, schools, parks, churches, right. those types of things. Those are the things that we're looking at uh, putting together. Um, they'll get to see the first draft next Tuesday, the, the stuff that we've got to their last discussions. It's only 33 pages long. So. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to do it, so it's a new one for us. Yeah, I'm sorry, we can't provide much help. Just as you know, uh, Lebanon is a little bit of a wall wall west. Uh, there's, there's no zoning. So we talk about land uses, there's not Okay. We don't we don't have those regulations up. Believe it or not, we have site plan review on in November on the ballot. So again, you guys already have this. We've never had it. So um, that will actually be a start for marijuana facilities being in the middle of nowhere. Um, as far as you know, we may be able to use that to help us with odor control and, and other things. But uh, we don't even have site plan review as of right now. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, we're, we're taking baby steps. We're taking we're trying to. Get yeah. I mean, that, I think the Sanford plan is South Portland as well. Yeah, the um, two ordinances that we're leaning on, South Portland and Sanford, have gone and done pretty extensive. Portland's in the midst. They're actually, I believe, they're having their first reading uh, next week. I think is their first reading on their marijuana because they passed moratorium three weeks ago. So they're having their first reading. They borrowed a lot of stuff from South Portland. South Portland did a, had a pretty extensive review of that stuff. Yeah, we, when we cracked, we cracked them out, we looked at South Portland, I know that. Yeah, and South Portland's pretty comprehensive, so right. we, we, we borrowed from both those, plus using our attorney to, to put together other, other information as well, just so we can figure out where we're going to go and how we're going to do it. Just interested to see what other towns are doing, because those are some of the questions that we were raising, because a lot of times on the coastal side have all, are not currently in the process of opting in. Right. A lot of them are staying opted out, and, uh, so the interesting part is where where those land uses will shift. And they're really not they're really not confined to municipal boundaries. It's really an industry into itself, and it's going to you know how is that going to play in with all the other towns and how 
the moratoriums along the coast, is that going to push things inward? How's that all going to play out? So. And in retail, we have a moratorium on all. So, which we won't extend because now basically the state has a moratorium. Right. Um, with the uh, So, uh, I don't know if there's any intention to change that, but right now we have a. And I will say here, we're very happy that the opt in worked out. So that, that, yeah. was, that was definitely one of the things yeah, that, from our perspective, is that was an initiative that we needed that allowed us to create, to create to, the, even though it would have been nice to get some tax revenue, um, that was the bigger piece of the pie, was allowing for local regulation, because before that there was no local regulation. And we were, you know, we were kind of, we were swimming in uncharted territory. I mean, you know, caregivers were coming in and, and, and requesting things, and we're saying, you know, we read the law and says you can't do this. I mean, even under the law, you're not allowed to do this. Well, we're going to do it anyway. It's like, but, but, so we're glad that the opt-in mm -hmm. feature. That's going to be a great benefit to the communities. Good. Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, I wish they would. I wish they would have passed some emergency legislation because we had to go special town meeting to get our moratorium in place. <laughs> but nonetheless, we, we protected ourselves. But for a lot of communities, there was that three-month gap that really put some of those towns. And I can tell you, a lot of towns have been bombarded. South Borough, because I mean, a good example of South Borough is now in court because of that. Um, you know, they're they're going to go through litigation regarding uh, regarding some of the requests that came in during that gap time frame. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, but, uh, but we were very appreciative that we got the opt in. That's, yeah. And definitely appreciate Tom Sedalia because he was really the, the pusher of that. So. Um, yeah, Tom, uh, Robert Gates, a, a few people. Um, that, that we viewed as really necessary to give towns breathing room to at least just develop, uh, have time to think about how to vet and how to um, handle these applications. Um, I should mention on the medical side, um, the, the opt-in is really just limited to what are called uh, commercial storefronts. Um, and, uh, and so otherwise, uh, the, that newer law says that municipalities cannot completely prohibit medical care workers. They can only um, uh, prohibited by not opting in the, the storefront aspect, and then um, and then they also can uh, uh, limit the number of care. We can't say only ten caregivers in town, but we can say only one store in town. Um, and and uh, it's also interesting. It was a, it was a one of those weird end of session twists. Everyone's kind of tired at the end of it. Um, why it, it, it was originally supposed to be emergency legislation. Even the industry wanted it to be emergency legislation. And uh, it was a close enough vote in the Senate. They needed two thirds, and uh, they held the vote at like ten o'clock or so at night. And they realized that a few of the members were either still at dinner or had left for the night. And so they wound up having to get it to pass. They wound up having to take off that two thirds requirement to make it an emergency. So um, that caught a lot of people off guard. That was unfortunate. Um, that was not uh, the plan, uh, and it has created this three month sort of uh, headache. But uh, fortunately, we now know that. Uh, December 13th is when the major medical marijuana law comes in, but um, I was really focused on trying to get this other smaller medical marijuana bill, LD 238, enacted um, to just clarify, um, to answer this question of, of to what extent municipalities could even try to regulate medical marijuana, which has been a, a big question for a long time. Um, on, the, on the rulemaking side of it, so um, uh, before uh, the state for, for the non-medical or adult use or recreational side, as you mentioned, the, the, the state will be putting out rules um, before they can do their licensing. So that is an effective moratorium. There's no, um, to be a legal commercial operator outside of medical, you have to have a state license and those state licenses won't be up until those rules are approved. The, uh, the rules have to be, or at least the majority of the rules have to be approved by the legislature and they're shooting to have the rules drafted by April. Um, which means they'll have to go back to the legislature kind of late in the session um, uh, if they even make that April uh, um, ballpark uh, um, uh, aim or deadline. Uh, so if the rules are out in April, uh, that's, that's probably some heavy lifting for the legislature to approve those at the end of their first session. I wouldn't be surprised if they wind up waiting on it until the second session, in which case those rules won't be approved until 2020. Uh, the medical rules, the, the um, state still, as far as, I'm, as far as I know, is still uh, regulating medical and issuing uh, licenses for that, but there will be uh, rules needed, um, necessitated by this new uh, law. And uh, so it, it looks like um, 
the state is uh, hiring an outside entity to draft the rules for the medical and non medical side. <coughs> and, and that also has a stable timeline. So um, the state of medical may be in flux a little bit too um, until the legislature approves the medical rules too. Um, and it is, it's going to be interesting to see how having these two different medical sector or marijuana sectors plays out. Um, given that now uh, medical, um, to be able to get medical marijuana legally, you had to have a prescription or a um, certification from a doctor that you met a, a few certain, um, you had one of a, a few certain types of conditions that the doctor thought um, uh, you, you could get the certification for. Um, the new law will say that a doctor can, can give that certification for anything that the doctor thinks that uh, marijuana or cannabis will relieve or alleviate. So um, that means I think a lot more people will wind up just going the medical route. The tax rate is also just a normal 5.5% sales tax on medical. Uh, and there's a much higher effective 20% uh, sales tax rate on non-medical once that industry is up and running. So until those taxes change, we might see medical be the, um, just my, my uh, hunch is that medical might be the predominant um, source of, of uh, legal marijuana in the state for, for some time. Um, but so this will be, you know, every year the, this landscape will change a bit. Um, and I, the last thing I'll say on this topic, unless there are more questions, is that uh, at MMA's convention last week, we had a seminar on um, this industry and we had uh, three different municipal officials present, uh, in addition to someone from MMA's legal services department. Uh, those towns were Acton, near here. Uh, they had a, a, what they call a commercial marijuana committee, um, met for several months and did uh, um, some really good work researching what's happened in municipalities and other states that have legalized. And they put together a report, you said your, yours is looking like 30 or so pages. Uh, theirs was 70, I think, plus an appendix that's 130 or so. So they've got 200 pages of research that's out there for free. Uh, and, and we posted it on MMA's Marijuana Resources page if you'd like to take a look at that. Um, they did a lot of uh, work. Uh, the select board wound up just adopting a, an ordinance that essentially just limited the personal growing to, um, to where the person is domiciled, where you live. Um, the state law allows. Uh, for growing on your parcel, growing another person's allotted amount if you want. And so Acton decided that they were just going to limit it to where people are, are living um, as a way to try to get around. Um, there's some concern out west in other states that that's been gained and people are, are forming co-ops or collectives by leasing out their, their property for growing. Um, that's one approach. You mentioned South Portland, uh, their assistant managers, uh, Josh Rennie was on the panel. Uh, Looks like South Portland's taking about as heavy as a, of a regulatory approach as, as I know of in, in Maine. And then we also had Hollowell's city manager. Uh, Hollowell's the smallest city in Maine, uh, I think. And Nate Rudy, there is um, the, their council, I think, uh, just the other night had their second reading of their draft ordinance and that. I think I just we'll received that this morning. Okay, <laughs> good deal. So I think we'll post that on MMA's website too as soon as it's uh, enacted. Uh, assuming it does get enacted, and that one's uh, it, it would be it would be interesting for all of you if you have the time and interest to compare South Portland's to Hollowell's. Hollowell's a probably less um, heavy regulatory approach and more just uh, fitting it into their existing land use ordinances. If you don't have land use, um, then then it's uh, it's a little bit different. Um, but uh, yeah, Sanford's odor approach was uh, about one of the most thoroughly vetted and thought through that uh, anyone's heard of, and it seems like it's working well, and it's been working there for some time. Yeah. Well, it's interesting level. just yeah. for the other towns, and I don't know if you guys are, one of the things that we're, we're looking at doing is that even though the state's not allowing, allowing us to collect taxes, we're gonna go licensing routes for our medical marijuana establishments, uh, that will, which will generate some revenue, certainly not gonna, it's not gonna be a windfall. Uh, but at least there's going to be a license group where, where we have yearly reviews on on those establishments. Uh, the Caldwell, actually, that second reading is next week. That's what I actually got today. Uh, their attorneys, our attorneys, so it's, it's nice. Okay. Um, and uh, South Portland went the same way with the licensing group. Uh, really good examples. Hollowell's is a much 
more simplistic licensing um, ordinance. If you're looking, South Portland's licensing ordinance is like 13 pages. Hollowell's is five. Um, so, but it's but some good examples for you guys to look at if you're looking at, at the licensing aspect of it. Uh, I know Hollowell's isn't released yet. But they, they did it, I think they've done the first thing they the second meeting next week. But uh, it's actually a very good document. And, uh, really good. Uh, at least instead of reinventing the wheel, at least it's something that it's been vetted. Uh, Drummond Woodson did the vetting on it, so we know that there's some good vetting on the on, on that side, and they they vetted it both from the municipal aspect as well as the commercial side. Because Drummond Woodson has their, their municipal side, but they also are very active in the on the, on the adult use commercial side. So there's some pretty good vetting on that. Okay. They're, they're the ones that drew it up. Uh, one thing I'd say on the licensing uh, revenue side of it is there is a state law about licensing in general because of the licensing that says that licensing fees have to be, um, uh, they can only cover reasonable, just. reasonable administrative, <laughs> uh, the cost of administering the program, which uh, most... But at uh, least it covers the cost. That's that's the biggest thing. It though. should, but there's a question as to whether it can even cost police, um, cover the cost of police type yeah, enforcement. I don't, I don't see that happening. So, yeah. yeah. We're just looking at it from a... From a uh, an administrative and regulatory view is that at least we'll be able to cover our costs as it relates to that. How do they, how do, just out of curiosity, so what determines a reasonable? Are there parameters for that? Uh, <clears throat> I think, unfortunately, so. I, I mean, uh, no. I, I but is there any MMA? Is it, yeah, there's a, they, I, don't, I don't think there's strict, uh, you know, numerical limits or anything like that on it. It's That's just, um, if, if, if the person who's, who's getting that license doesn't think it's reasonable, they'd have to um, sue to, to, and have to go before a judge to say whether or not it's, it is in a reasonable realm, and then the town would have to show uh, its justification for what it's charging. Um, um, but uh, yeah, otherwise it's just English says that it needs to be reasonably related to the administrative cost of enforcement, something like that. And again, Stafford's charging 1500 a year, uh, Hollowell's Two hundred fifty dollars a year. Yep. Uh, South Portland's five hundred a year. And there's different, you know, very different uh, levels of staff in each. And the, the cities like South Portland and Sanford have much more staff than in uh, small towns, and um, so it depends how many people are looking at it, betting it. Um, big differentials, but again, yeah, it looks like we are going to be pushing, and I won't be surprised if the industry is pushing for uh, municipal revenues too to help uh, make make the towns whole for uh, really. Um, What's a, an investment? Uh, the, the town is helping, yeah, as it does with any industry. It's, it's um, uh, our, our view is that municipalities are entitled to return on their investment in terms of staff time um, and, and what they're doing to try to um, lay the groundwork for any business in town. So that's part of the basis for revenue sharing in general, and uh, carries over to our view on, on marijuana. And the reason we think a, a separate amount uh, is is makes sense you know, above and beyond the ordinary revenue sharing for the marijuana industry is just that it's so new and uncertain and has a lot of unknowns. One being the cash aspect of it, um, that's, um, you've seen reports probably of, of crime with that. There's this new aspect of it as well on extraction. So people aren't just looking for the plant anymore, but they're looking for concentrated um, uh, parts of the plant. And, and so uh, um, part of the medical law that got enacted would require some state sign off on the extraction to help make sure it's safe. But uh, there was an issue in Biddeford, um, one or two issues where they, um, um, you know, uh, some of that extraction equipment is pretty dangerous, um, explosive, and uh, there's firefighters went in in one building, there was a fire, and, and uh, there, was a, there was an extraction machine or equipment in an apartment that had the flames hit it, it would have been a huge explosion um, that might have, while the firefighters were in there, uh, caused some serious damage. Um, and fortunately, the flames didn't get to that equipment, but um, it was a close call. And, and, and so there, there are all kinds of sort of unexpected issues that will get teased out over the next few years. And, and so that's part of why we think it makes sense. Uh, and, and the state's looking, unlike other industries um, necessarily, the state's looking for municipalities to help for this to be a partnership with state and local enforcement. So if it really is going to have dual enforcement, it ought to have a dual share um, in the uh, um, the costs and revenues. That's my opinion. <laughs> so 
Why, and I wasn't in the committees, but I, and I asked this question to multiple people, there was an educational piece and there was funding for the police and, and for us to be, to be able to address this. And it didn't seem like that high of a cost. Not being there, I never got a direct answer as to why that was removed. Hmm. There, there is, I think it might have, rather than being completely removed from the adult use law, um, or I don't know if there was one in medical too that I'm missing, mm -hmm. but on the non-medical, uh, before that had its own separate committees, you know, and, and they um, wound up uh, just coming up with, I think it's 5% of the state revenue is going to go to this public health community safety, something like that, um, fund. And, uh, and that's supposed to go towards um, training and education on, um, um, from everywhere from schools to police departments and state police and, and uh, um, what have you. So, so I think there is still some provision in the law for that, but it's, um, it's yet to be seen how that's gonna be um, dispersed and whether the state will keep a lot of that for state level training or if it'll, I, you know, I'm optimistic that uh, that'll be a balance and you know, half of that'll uh, go back towards community level uh, education. So there is some cut. Uh, probably many people will probably should be more. Yeah, I, I do because I think that the brunt of it is going to fall on the smaller communities and a lot of them are the communities that aren't going to have the, rep, the resources to be able to deal with it. And Lemon comes to mind right to the top of my head. Mm -hmm. That whomever is there can work on that. The, uh, you haven't heard anything about whether they'll keep the, the, the legislature, this last one, the 128th legislature, formed a marijuana legalization implementation committee, they called it. And, uh, and so it's up to each new legislature gets to decide what committees will be there. And so you have the ordinary ones. You know, education's not going anywhere, healthcare's not going anywhere. Um, I don't know whether the legislature will continue to have a separate standalone committee for marijuana. Um, I, I imagine they would, but I don't know. Um, so but these issues will keep coming up, and um, either way, however, whichever committee it goes to, um, there will be some. There's always opportunity to, if, if you can't make it to the legislature to testify, I, I suggest that you consider just emailing uh, your testimony in if you want to put something in writing. Um, that's always helpful too. Um, I can get the. I'll, I'll leave this list of your um, members on the legislative policy committee too that you should. Um, not hesitate to uh, communicate with to let them know your perspective and and myself as well. So um, uh, we legislators see the, the free advocates from MMA um, just like they see other lobbyists regularly. When they see people from their own district, from their town, who are members of select boards, um, I think that's the most powerful lobbying tool next to children, uh, little kids. I don't know why they are the most effective advocates at the state house, but. Um, Unless you're bringing your kids with you, um, you know, if, if you can't make it there, if you can't so make it there. So we got to curse all our great. kids in state revenue sharing and then ship them on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> <laughs> ship them on the state level. <laughs> 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 yeah, puppies probably. They're a little less articulate today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, any, any bill that uh, the kids show up for seems to get through. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and uh, but yeah, municipal officials really, if, if you show up, it, it looks to me like and if, if you can't show up because it's far away, um, if you don't have the time uh, submitting something away, um, or just picking up the phone and calling your legislators, uh, usually, hopefully, pretty effective too. Hedgehog for a classic example. <laughs> Hedgehog bill. Oh, yeah. That there's, was pretty funny. There's, there's, there's some odd ones, yeah. 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 I got one other question I don't know. Have any of the other towns dealt with this? This on the medical or marijuana side, have dealt with trailers that are being used? Is basically growth facilities, so somebody because again, it's not a building, so it's it's so we again we don't have any zoning, so kind of so under our zoning we don't allow that. So even even I can tell you, North Park stance is always we've been a little more proactive. So even before we had the ability to technically review those review uh, commercial grows, we were especially if they're being done on somebody's property that's not owned by the person. So if it's being done in commercial buildings or industrial buildings, uh, we've been saying that through our planning board and doing those reviews anyway. Um, so those are things that we went to, we went to love because we've been already trying to stay abreast of addressing the. So somebody buildings. couldn't bring their own, bring a tractor trailer onto their property. 
Just like a vehicle. The if vehicle they're doing it, it, I mean, if they're doing it within the, as a as a home grow, uh, there's, there's Again, little, little on, that you can do it. I don't, don't know. Do you? It's like it's on wheels. It's got an AC unit. They got power running to it, but it's on wheels. It's registered, so it's not a building. We haven't had that really had that problem, again. but I know of. No. That. But you know, of. okay. Yeah. No. There was an issue with uh, so-called tiny homes. Um, people were trying to get out of code enforcement, uh, saying that they're they're not really a, a permanent structure, and so the state figured out some codes for those. Um, I mean, one of our components of what we're looking at is we're going to actually do a home home cultivation rules as well. Mm -hmm. Just just the, so at least it's it's, it's addressed within right. our community. So we're looking at limiting to 25% of your residential dwelling or maximum 120 square feet. Uh, that number actually came from Sanford. Sanford's the one that came up with that. Both South Portland and Sanford actually both have that same that same. How do you plan on policing that? Uh, that's the diff that's the difficult part. It's really going to be on the home side. We're not going to have they're not going to have to get a conditional use permit. They're just going to be able to do it. Um, so it's really going to be reliant on if somebody, if a complaint is filed. Uh, if people come to us, that's, we'll tell them that, that that's what they have to do. Um, we currently, in our, within our ordinance, we already have odor controls and things like that. Certainly not as strict as what we're looking to expand to, uh, but we already have some odor control requirements within our, within. So we've actually had to do that with a few home growers within our, within our community, um, where we've had to go to them and say, you know, it's, it stinks, you need to do something. Um, all our commercial growers, we've actually, they've gone through the plan board, they've had to go through the, through the engineering to, to put their, to put their, uh, their scrubbers in and have the, you know, the negative, negative uh, airflow and all that stuff so nothing gets outside of the building. Um, and even that, sometimes they fail and I can tell you, it doesn't take long for, for them to fail for our code enforcement officer's phone to be ringing. And it rings and we go. Uh, and I will say, all, all the people that are currently within our community have been, that are growing, when we, when we approach them, they're actually, they, you know, they're, they're, there's never been an issue of them saying, we're not going to fix it. They're really Johnny on the spot. We're going to fix it. And, and usually within a day, it's all, it's all. Are you regulating the number of uh, dispensaries for medical marijuana? Dispensaries, we currently, we currently have the allowance of one within our community. Yeah. I think I That's think looking at looking if you if and we had this long discussion, but if you're looking at now with the availability of retail stores, if you're going to allow retail stores within your town, I can tell you no one's going to put it. My personal opinion, okay, is that no one's going to put dispensaries within your community. Dispensaries have to go through that whole state licensing mm -hmm. process. It's the paperwork will kill you when you can go and open a retail store and basically do the exact same thing. I mean, so that I think you're going to see more retail stores because you know, they don't have to go through the whole dispensary process. They say I'm, I'm a caregiver and I'm going to I'm going to sell medical marijuana through a retail store outlet. They basically become a de facto dispensary without having to go through all the state paperwork. Tom Manchester, if you travel 202, <coughs> five uh, district yard outlets for medical marijuana. Hmm. Five of them. You know, it just Amazes me that they can actually manage those and they don't do anything. That, that was my commute home uh, for uh, for a while. I was living in Winthrop and uh, just moved, and uh, and I was surprised to see you know one open a couple months later, another one open a couple of months later. And so uh, Hollowell's concern, I, I think it's safe to say, in some of the smaller town, if you have a small downtown, there's a concern that that a lot of the um, Retail space will be taken up by these stores, and then we'll see how the market plays out. Just market economics; uh, some of them will close, and so uh, there's concern about just um, opportunity cost of other businesses that would have moved. Paul, we're really concerned, concerned about the prime site and what the developer will do there. Yeah. And I think we've got that covered. Yeah. Hollowell, Hollowell is going to limit to three uh, within their downtown area. That's the thing that they're going to stop at three. We're looking at one. That's what we're going to look at, and we're going to do. Um, some sort of lottery. Um. Well, the other piece of that too is that we also do not want um, pop leaf, you know, logos, you know, front of the spending on the, on the front windows, you know, either. So that's a, that's just an additional concern too. So that's a part. Of, that's a part of our discussion. The, the appearance of the retail. 
in, in this area too, the cross border impact is going to be something that you'll feel you know, like other parts of the state won't. Yeah, so yeah. it's going to be really interesting. Just Especially yeah. with New Hampshire not having legalization currently. So. Yeah, and we're, well, if South Burley doesn't do it, our towns will be the closest to UNH. Sure. New Hampshire State Troopers are going to have their hands. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, at the two bridges, you know. Well, we don't want to become a mecca. Mm -hmm. Right. So a, a destination. Is like, we've you know. regulated uh, where they can smoke in no public places and things like that. I've been to places where it's legal, and if it smell in public areas, it's just offensive. Right. We did that this past year as well. Yeah. So. One of our uh, presenters at the convention said that the smell is in the nose of the beholder, that you know, the people who like it love the smell. It's, it's so the guys are selling it, say it smells like money. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's like the paper mill. Paper mill. Right. Yeah. 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 It's a yeah. smell of money. Yeah. I grew up in paper mill town. I know all the offensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On a different topic, on the revenue sharing, when and what year is that expected to go back? Uh, that is scheduled, I believe, for 2019 or 2020. Um, it's in state law right now that it's supposed to ramp back up. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, yep, exactly. So, um, the, the, the legislature would have to change the law again or uh, find a way around it um, to change that. Our view is, you know, there's been, um, it's just so happened that the state um, budget surplus has been about what um, would have been paid to municipalities to revenue sharing that they hadn't uh, cut it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I think we'll be making that point right now. The revenue projections, the economy's been strong enough that the revenue projections have been uh, uh, sort of slightly over. So that, you know, um, before, early on, when there are raids, um, maybe there were, there were issues with state revenues, but that's certainly not the case right now. So it's really a question of uh, political willpower um, and, and what does their, their competing interest for state money, as we all know. And, and so the legislators will have to pick and choose, but we're hoping they'll honor that um, uh, time honored tradition of, uh, you know, they call it, uh, we're hoping to restore the state local partnership as this. Um, uh, the, the title of our, the subtitle of our 2018 municipal issues paper is reestablishing the state municipal partnership. Most partnerships I know of are, you know, 50 50, 60 40, maybe, maybe even 70 30, but 95 to 5 seems like a pretty good deal, in my view. So, um, you know, I don't think it's too much to ask, but we'll see. It is a, it's a, it's, it's a chunk of the budget, no question. But well, you mentioned, you know, that the state law is there that goes back up. But the state law is also there for the school funding. I mean, that has not happened. And uh, what are the chances of that getting you know, fully funded? That is a much, I'd say that one's even trickier um, because the, the each percent of the education funding is, is huge and I don't know the numbers offhand, but, but getting to that 55% has been a huge chunk of the budget, huge challenge, and so what the state did recently was kind of redefine what the state's share covered, and, uh, and, and so we're hoping that they will re redefine it in a way that um, accounts for the actual local costs a little bit better. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, it should be 160 million more, I guess, to 55%. Uh, that's according to the NBA. Okay. Yeah. 160 million more. Yeah, it, it, yeah. <coughs> Um, but as you said, I mean, when they redefine what revenue sharing is, that changes that number, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's that, and or not revenue. I mean, the right. fit, school, funding. school funding, right. you know. So, you know, that's probably the two biggest issues impacting property taxes and towns. So uh, yeah, our view is, you know, that um, they, they call the tax mix the three-legged stool, uh, sales, property, and, and income. And uh, it's been really uh, heavy on the property side. And so uh, MMA's been pushing since long before I've been there to get more balance there. Um, some state legislatures have gotten close, some have not. There's always different views on which taxes should be lower, which should be higher. and, um, and 
I don't have a crystal ball. I, I, we'll see how this election goes, and we'll see what the new uh, legislature and governor, um, what their view is on which taxes to prioritize lowering, which um, to, you know, I was about to say raising, but no one will ever say they're going to raise, so I don't know. We'll see. Well, we have a pretty healthy balance, don't we? Surplus? Surplus, yeah. Yeah, 174.8 million. But no one's counting. You know it's counting. Yeah. <laughs> Is there, I just out of curiosity, um, and I thought actually, I thought this was very well put together. Um, and I was just wondering, just you know, on the topic of education, just sort of uh, educating the next generation. Is there any outreach from MMA to local education units in terms of promoting, you know, these materials or encouraging, um, you know, certainly social studies teachers to be incorporating some of this, you know, into their curriculum? Because I just think it's really, I mean, just an important source of information. Great. Okay, um, so I didn't know if that was anything that typically happened. That's just a Great question. I only recently learned that apparently civics is no longer a mandatory part of the curriculum. Yeah. So that yeah, really sad. I mean, yeah. it's um, very sad. I, I, it is uh, free on our website, so I, I uh, encourage people, but I don't know that we're making any push right now. We also have a book called Local Government in Maine uh, that's been around since the 80s, I think, that just explains how local government works. Um, and that, I think some schools have used that as sort of a textbook type uh, material. I think we updated it a few years ago, 2015 maybe. Um, so that's a great resource as well on top of this. Uh, this is more, you know, timely issues, but for a general overview of yeah. local government in Maine, that's good. Um, and then on the on the school front, you know, the, there are a, a few organizations at the state level that are focused, like Maine Education Association, you know, the um, Maine School Management Association, both um, do so much on that, in that realm, that um, a, a lot of the lead, um, I, I think it's safe to say that, that uh, they take the lead on, on education matters and, and they certainly weighs in, um, but probably doesn't drive that policy yeah. quite as much as those organizations do. I would like to see the schools, especially uh, the high schools and the middle schools, reach out to the local town managers to go into the classroom and, and, and talk about local government and talk about you know, how it works and, and the opportunities for jobs. I mean, I know MMA is doing a great job in you know, looking for people to fill positions and letting the public know those people know that there are careers in local government. And, I, and I, every time I've been in, I've reached out to the school for that and have got a response. So. I do it at a private school every year. Good. It was yeah. where my kids went to school. I think that was one of the part of the curriculum as a social studies teacher. Yeah. They actually still have civics in that yeah. school. And part of the whenever that she did local government, I went in and did a talk with the kids. To do it at Coney High School in the economics class. And it's just it's, it's great because most of the kids, first of all, they don't have any, they, don't, they really don't have a clue what really goes on right. in local yeah. government. But it's also that whole idea is that is, is, is civics is an important part of, of our our civic duty as an American citizen and, and understanding the, just those different realms. No, the state, the local, and the federal, the federal side. It's such, yeah. such an important thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, well, I teach at the community college, and you now when I'm advising kids, they have to take gen ed courses, and I'm, I always ask them, so what are the three branches of government? And if they can't tell me, it's right away, you're, you're taking American government. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it would be great to see your organization maybe at you know one of those meetings bring that issue up. Uh, you know, I'm an educator and a social studies teacher, uh, and <clears throat> nobody um, is really advocating that it's disappearing. Mm -hmm. Everything is English and math, and you know, local government would be a great thing to see school boards embracing and to see an organization like yours providing information. For teachers to use. Great. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I just uh, this day, hopefully this one's only a cop out, but uh, what I mentioned at the beginning is that uh, MMA's positions aren't decided by uh, staff; it's decided by our policy committee and executive committee. So um, 
you know, you might put in a plug or a call to your uh, policy committee members. And I'll, um, sorry, I didn't bring uh, more copies of this today, but uh, hopefully we can I can follow up with an email to all of you the contact information. And um, the platform's not set yet, so that that might be uh, you know a possibility for a meeting or something. Um, I'd also say actually for any uh, kids or adults watching who are interested, um, you know, I, I consider myself fairly civically minded and I only just joined, uh, I, I joined uh, Winthrop's planning board um, about four years ago, I was on it for a better part of three years and it was a great experience and so there's all kinds of different committees and boards to serve on and uh, yeah, they're typically volunteer capacity but um, anyone who has extra time. Um, I think it's a you know really rewarding experience and learned a lot. We had a few planning board members join who had come before the planning board as applicants, and they just found the process interesting. And we had a vacancy or two, and um, I imagine that's the case in other towns. So I'll be continuing my, my new town. I'm moving to Georgetown and, and uh, um, volunteering for the planning board there too. If they'll, if they'll have me, but it would be really great to see those 70 people and see how they feel about it. Okay. I'd love to see that, bro. Okay, well, let me see if I can put it in the plug. <laughs> well, I know Maine County City Managers encourages the managers to get into the local schools if you can right. to do something like that. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure how successful everybody is. <clears throat> yeah, obviously you are, but like a lot of times I've been in, you have to really pry yourself into the school system to, to get. Well, I think what's, what's happened, too, I think, unfortunately, I think, you know, curriculums, um, I think, I think a lot of humanities teachers have had a lot more freedom in, in past years regarding their curriculums. And I think what's been happening is that, you know, those parameters for instruction have been, you know, increasingly more narrowly defined. Um, and you, you are under constraint in terms of what you're allowed to, you know, cover within a given school year. You know, and I think it's, you know, partially a function of that, but I think that's why it's critically important, I think, you know, for all of us to be bringing some pressure to bear um, so that, you know, we start demanding, you know, as people involved with town government that our children become educated, you know, in what happens within a town, you know, otherwise, you know, kids are just going to lose that connection. I mean, it's, it's just such a critical piece, I think, today. And I'll just say, you know, being in the arts, in the schools as well, that uh, the same as social studies, I mean, the focus of testing is math, reading, writing. Right. And our kids don't even get tested at social studies anymore. Well, and that's you know, and I mean, so there's only so much time in the day. So yeah. Yeah. it's not that I don't think it's important, but I think educators are just like, yeah. Yeah. you know, where's the time? And I don't think, you know, I don't think a lot of, uh, just not to digress too much, you know, to get into the weeds, you know, with all of this, but, you know, I don't think there's a lot of awareness, you know, of that fact. Yeah. You know, for whatever reason, you know, humanities-based instruction is, is just dispensable in terms of, you know, testing children and in terms of what they should know, you know, in, in this topic area. Um, and it is, it's just very math and science driven right now. And I think, you know, there needs to be some pushback with that, um, you know, to sort of, you know, reintroduce the importance of civics education. It's a great um, segue to, I, I was hoping uh, in being here tonight, not just I've uh, probably been speaking too much, but um, to, to hear more about what um, everyone in this neck of the woods is looking for from the state. So um, here in civics, <laughs> pretty loud and clear. Um, money. And, and, yeah. <laughs> money. money. <laughs> oh, I mean, that, that, that rebalancing of the stool that you talked about, you know, I mean, I think a lot has been put on the property taxes and you know, I talk to a lot of seniors who are saying they're starting to have trouble, you know, paying their property tax and staying in their home. And that, you know, if it continues, it's going to be a real problem. Um, it, you know, now a middle income person is paying, you know, 14 plus percent of their income in state and local taxes. While you know the upper income, where, which got some decent tax cuts on the income side, are paying under 10 percent. You know, and it's just, I think a lot of people are feeling frustrated. You know, I mean, it feels like we're pitting uh, two most vulnerable groups against each other. 
our kids that we're educating and our seniors. Um, and it should be about really protecting those two vulnerable groups. And as a state, I think we're really falling short um, in that area. And the biggest reason that that's happening, I think, is, is the revenue share and, um, and not funding education at 55%. Um, so it's a really tough spot that a lot of Mainers are in, in our towns, in our district, you know, um, raising our property taxes to <clears throat> pay for our education. Um, and it, it doesn't always go over well. And I think the state's in a position where they really could help out and make a, a huge impact. And we've seen it go in the opposite direction. But we do, like, in our district, teach civics to seniors for half a year. I don't think that really revolves around any local government. Um, they have to attend a local meeting. I think that's the extent of local government that's taught, you know, in our three towns. And, um, I think we could certainly put a push in at a younger level and, um, and as seniors um, to you know, define what a town manager is and, you know, volunteering on boards and, you know, the responsibilities of, of citizenship are just out the window and everybody wants to complain um, and nobody wants to volunteer. <laughs> and we're not teaching that, um, those responsibilities. We're only kind of teaching them, well, these are your rights. It's a tough balance. Dad, can you talk about, um one of the things that we're always, everybody's always looking, you know, for more funding for important issues, and all the issues we've talked about are important. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, and I've worked with the Maine Rural Water Association and the MMA on our crumbling infrastructure, our water and sewer infrastructure, and I think that's another really important issue that we should be looking at. I don't know if you've taken a position, if MMA's taken a position on that the bonding that's coming out to help assist with that. Um, but that's pretty near and dear to me, and that's another thing, if we don't fund the, that and fund it properly, it causes health issues. Can, can you talk about MMA? And Absolutely, yeah, it's uh, one of my favorite topics too, because it seems to be one of the few things that everyone agrees on. Uh, it's not a partisan issue, it's everyone sees the infrastructure needs. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so it is, um, it, it looks like making the cut for in the, in the theme area of our platform. Um, there's a lot of concern um, just with, with uh, not only whether the state has enough money um, for its infrastructure and helping out with the local roads programs and, and uh, uh, water and wastewater, things like that, um, but also the way that the money's spent. Um, so sometimes the paving, there's a view that the um, you know money's put towards a skinny mix, they call it, uh, that lasts a couple <laughs> years. Um, and because that's cheaper in the short term, when you might try something that's, oh, you know, you know, did, I, <laughs> you know it's, it's not an discussion any, ourselves. All right, yeah, anywhere in Maine you go, I think, that, I think that's a statewide issue is, is it, you know, would it be, um, a little bit uh, more effective to put more money in up front on, on pavement that lasts longer, things like that. Um, but then, yeah, the, the water infrastructure, uh, sewer to um, issue is a national issue. Um, and and um, there have been all kinds of different ways to look at it. I was, when I was in grad school, I looked at how Senator Muskie um, came up with this new federal program that would put money into it. Um, when, when uh, the times were bad economically. It was called Intergovernmental Counter-Cyclical Assistance. It's probably the only time that term will get well, about. Yeah. Uh, but but there, you know, uh, there have been a lot of good uh, ideas for approaching that. Where they go, um, you know, it's a, that's something that even, um, you know, on, on the roads, um, I think the state can play a lot uh, of a, a healthy role with that. But, but in terms of just the major um, needs, um, statewide, I, I think, I'm hoping the feds um, can, can find a way, uh, you know, agreement, consensus in Washington is extremely hard to come by, but I'm optimistic that the that infrastructure is one where they could um, find a way. Um, 
the last plan that I had seen proposed was actually putting more of a local share on infrastructure. I don't know that that's uh, rather, it, it was, it was cool. 70, yeah. Yeah. it's always been 70, 30 uh, federal, uh, pay, the federal, state and local share, 70, 30. And the idea was to flip that. So, uh, I don't, but that didn't get very far. So, um, uh, and, and yeah, the bond that's out right now, um, I am going to take a pass on, I, I want to say that MMA, um, we put in our own transportation bond. Um, so, so I know that MMA was supportive of, the, of that approach and I'm, I'm pretty sure we support the current bond, but um, I don't want to say that officially on the record just in case I'm, I'm mistaken about that. But um, generally, MMA is, you know, uh, it's, it's rare that you'll see us oppose um, uh, infrastructure issue. I think where we might, the, the comment that I've heard our legislative policy committee say is, is a concern about um, paying for it with bonding. So yeah, everyone agrees that it should be paid for, but then um, for 10 years or so, it's been paid for out of bonds instead of out of um, highway fund, uh, which is based on uh, consistent um, uh, you know, gas tax revenues and, and other sources. And so um, you know, how to pay for it is, the, is more of the question than whether to pay for it, for sure. Um, and, and so, the, uh, but but it is one of it's it's generally a common ground issue. Um, you know, we all see the need. So, has there been any discussion about looking at a revenue potential revenue stream in terms of raising our tourism um, tax structure? And I know it's that's always you know you know you always of course here you know chambers of commerce start screaming when you raise that topic, but. You know, um, I think it's, it continues to be an area that we don't emphasize enough. And I know the argument always is, well, if we tax too much, they won't come. And I will tell you, you know, having lived in this area for some time, um, people will always be coming to this area um, from away. So um, I guess, you know, I'm wondering how much MMA is advocating for perhaps trying to raise a little bit more through tourism um, I think our policy committee sees that, you know, probably the majority of the committee sees that um, it would be nice to try to take the burden off of the, the residents uh, who are having a tough time paying property taxes and, and try to um, shift it to um, visitors. I, I'm not sure whether we'll be putting something forward, but um, you know, I, I suspect that someone will put in a bill, typically it's, it's raising the meals and lodging tax. Yep. Um, is the way to uh, approach that, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if MMA supported that. Um, but I, well, it's not only that, you know, I mean, I look at the fact if I travel out of state and stay at a hotel, I mean, there are probably five different little <laughs> yeah. Yeah. separate taxes, fees, whatever, yeah. you know, and, you know, I just think we could probably be doing a little bit more, you know, in that area. Yeah. Another area is local taxation. So many states allow, uh, they call it local well, option, right. sales tax. Right. I uh, mean, it's not uh, allowed that. Um, it's been proposed in the past. I bet why, it will be not? proposed again. What, what are the, the, the concern, the, I mean, the, there's a general concern about too much taxation. Um, but, but then the, the local concern is that if it's, if it's up to um, each town whether um, to, to uh, um, assess that local tax and then how much to make it um, for, then that could actually pit some communities against each other. Um, but uh, uh, you know, uh, given given how much need there is, I think there's been uh, it seems to me like a little bit in the municipal community a uh, growing support for that approach. Um, and and so you know um, so in other states have all kinds of different approaches. Some yeah, if, if you go to a big city, um, you'll see uh, maybe up to a ten percent local tax, something like that. Uh, I. I think if it gets proposed, if it were to get thrown in Maine, it would probably be a really small local tax. Um, but that's another that's another idea. Local meals and lodging. Now I'm getting a little bit into my boss Kate DeFore's uh, realm. She is the tax that she's one of the states uh, foremost, uh, um, most knowledgeable people on tax policy. And if you really want to get into that, um, I could I could ask Kate if she wanted to come back uh, down to this group sometime. Um, uh, and she could tell you a lot more and explain. I don't know, maybe correct anything that I've said. That was before I realized the cameras were uh, going to be rolling tonight. I was going to start with a disclaimer that 
any advice that I give you that doesn't pan out. Uh, I, never, you never, I was never here. Um, it didn't come from me, but... Uh, we'll make sure we send Kate to Kate. Yeah. 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 I changed sub subject a little bit is, um, you know, municipal jobs. And, you know, whether it's police, fire, code enforcement, finance directors, all the towns, all the municipalities are having a hard time finding qualified people. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing to try to help with us, help that? Or? We thought about putting in a bill, I think um, I might have mentioned before that that's probably more of the, that, that goes to the state's general uh, labor shortage issue with the workforce and the aging population. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I, I think it's safe to say it's somewhat less acute in southern Maine than northern Maine, but either way, we're the oldest or next to oldest state in the, in the nation. Um, and, uh, and yeah, retirements are an issue no matter what town you talk to, um, finding people to fill those roles. Um, so we've, uh, MMA has had this um, sort of uh, media type push advocating for the merits of working, uh, thinking about a, a job with local government. Um, a great um, option uh, after school. The benefits are usually pretty good. Uh, and so there's more on, um, uh, I think it's called Hometown Careers is what we're calling it. If you, if you go to MMA's website, there's a whole section on Hometown Careers that can explain that more. Uh, it posts all of the jobs that are available, or at least that have been shared with MMA. Um, and then I think on the legislative front, we're probably gonna see what workforce development proposals come forward and, and what we can support. Um, I don't know that we've got um, specifics right now, um, but anything that uh, improves uh, what they call in-migration, getting people to move here or return to Maine um, is, uh, is uh, something that we'll likely be supportive of. Um, for me, uh, I left the state for a while for undergrad, and once I, I came back, I thought it would be short term. Once I was back in Maine, I said, uh, "There's, you know, I, I love visiting other areas, but but I, uh, I I hope that people who have left will, you know, if they can do so much as come back here in um, summertime or fall, you know, this time of year. It's it's uh, you didn't have, no one had to twist my arm to stay here, and um, and I, I think it." it we had the, the start of MMA's convention last week was uh, the state economist Amanda Rector. I think she goes to towns too. Um, might be willing to speak about that demographic issue. That was the whole opening of our convention was demographics in Maine. And uh, some interesting numbers, some cause for optimism in terms of people starting to move here. Um, it's been, uh, the trend is starting to get a little bit better, but um, also cause for concern when you see the, the baby boomers um, nearing retirement or starting to retire. It's a huge chunk of Maine's population, so um, so yeah, there will be a need, um, and, and it's probably safe to say that it's beyond the um, <coughs> scope of something MMA can can uh, make or break. But uh, hopefully, we can we can help with with the efforts that. But I think there's a view that it needs to be a concerted statewide effort um, with some leadership at the state level on it as well. So we we have been looking for various you know positions to fill and. It got plenty of applicants, but nobody with any municipal experience. You know, and, and the transition from the private sector to the municipal is really hard for some of them. They just don't work out. Mm -hmm. And the wage differences. You know, you go out of Boston. Right. You know, you can't compete. You know, and businesses can't. Not going to look to pay more. And you know, I hear the the uh, construction industry is, is out of two to three years in what they have for. Backlog, yeah. but they can't find people, the trades people to come in. Yeah. But when you, you have the bigger unions down south who are paying better, um, it's, it's not going to attract that kind of that population. Well, there's also been a shift, you know, not to get back into the education realm, but there's also been such a market shift away from uh, providing kids with exposure to, you know, industrial arts based types yeah. of education. Yeah. You know, there's just been just a total movement away from that, you know, and I think you can, you know, attribute, you know, some of those difficulties directly to that, you know, and hopefully, you know, there's been a lot of, I think, a lot of talk about that lately, and so hopefully, you know, we're going to be perhaps, you know, getting, getting back to that emphasis more. But uh, my other thought was in terms of just trying to look at, you know, resources. Um, I would like to see more emphasis placed on trying to connect the two mains. 
um, and find a way to perhaps promote everything that we have available in terms of you know, employment opportunities, you know, down here in the southern part of the state, trying to attract people, you know, from the northern regions of kids, who, you know, who live in the northern regions of the state, you know, and uh, encourage them to, you know, be able to stay in their own state, but, you know, find, you know, better employment opportunities. So, I don't know if there are any initiatives, you know, in that regard, but it's, uh, you know, we still have that, you know, dichotomy here. It's just, you know, you have two different being two different states almost. I do know the community colleges got a bunch of money for workforce development, you know, mm -hmm. buzzword, and been working on, um, you know, doing things. We've got a big program going with Pratt, you know, and they also end up at the shipyard too, uh, in machine tooling. Um, you know, we've been working on even, you know, culinary arts. Uh, I've had a student who, you know, didn't like culinary, and we ended up setting them up with an uh, internship with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, you know, which I mean, was thrilling by, you know. Um, so there are those efforts going on, and some, especially in the manufacturing area, it's not feasible for high schools to be doing it because you know, we've got million dollar machines that we're training them on and to have them at every high school is going to be mighty pricey. I mean, it, it's, it's so computer oriented now, you know, but, um, you know, there is stuff being done, but there needs to be more. I do know that they have a program for, for giving student loans um, for some targeted areas, you know, maybe that could be expanded so that, you know, people with um, MPAs might get some forgiveness and that might help out towns. I mean, at least on the, you know, the, for the jobs we need with four-year degrees, but then there's the jobs you don't need a four-year degree on that are still an issue that need more attention. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that. We've actually been, unfortunately, I've been doing a bunch of hiring recently, but fortunately, I mean, we've used Indeed in past years, I don't think they ever used Indeed, and we get a ton of applicants, but we actually have a pretty young workforce, and we've got one that's already in that, the career, he's on, he's on the video, he was in last year, but we're probably, I, I wouldn't doubt it, we're one of the youngest town offices in the state, just because it's, and you're not gonna get young people that have experience, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you want old people, well then, you're gonna get experience, and then you just go on MMA, but the problem is, the demographics are all retirement, so there's not a lot of them anymore. So, I mean, we're just, um, I think we've been fortunate. I mean, we've got a phenomenal crew now, I think, and I just, you know, but, but they're new and they're learning. But it's, you know, attitude is everything. And so I think I wouldn't be scared to go on outside sources and get young people because there are people that are looking for whatever reason to change jobs. And I think a lot of the skills are transferable. They just don't have the experience that they I mean, I wouldn't be shy to do that. Just uh, take my MA hat off for a second. The, uh, you may used to have a public administration degree that was a real feeder for uh, um, uh, you know manager type jobs and things along those lines. And they, uh, I'm a graduate. Yeah, okay, good deal. Yeah, so <laughs> that program the was oldest certified program in the country. And it dissolved. It. They dissolved in 2010. I want to say. Uh, I'm a Muskie school alum that uh, is teaching. They have one or two of the, the former teachers are at Muskie now, and, and they're trying to do some training for that. But um, personally, I would hope that the humane system and the community college system would think about that degree. I, I wouldn't, I don't know, otherwise I'll have to talk MMA into offering some more <laughs> school. <laughs> but, but, uh, looking for me, and yeah. they end up going out, and then they don't get the applicants and don't see the ones they need. They go back out. I've seen towns go out two or three times looking for people. Yeah. Same thing with finance directors, code enforcement people. Yeah. Same thing with superintendents. What's that? It's the same thing with superintendents. Yeah. So, well, you know, it's, I mean, on the business level, I know at York County, uh, the accounting, they do have courses in governmental accounting. You know, uh, so that might be something that is an area, you know, where maybe a little more concentration, um, um, you know, that 
the government side might be a good idea. Mention it to the party chair. <laughs> Um, uh, this is reminding me too that I, I think no matter who gets elected this fall, there's going to be opportunity for and, and no shortage of proposals on this topic. I, um, uh, MMA did interviews with the four gubernatorial candidates. They're on our website um, right now. They're, they're long. Our executive committee interviewed them for I think it was an hour piece. So I don't know if any of you have time to watch, but. Um, and, and this topic came up, and they all had ideas on it. So um, I, I think I'd be surprised if um, if this wasn't one of the major uh, issues that gets a lot of vetting and discussion uh, in the next legislative session. Um, I don't know if anyone has the single uh, silver bullet kind of solution to it, but uh, it's 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 not something that's that's lost on anyone, as far as I can tell. I think um, one of the we have expanded on apprenticeship programs in the whole state of Maine, and I think that's really important that we continue and we kind of cut some of the red tape and the regulations that are on these apprentice programs because a lot of kids that I'm seeing they're they they're good with their hands for for plumbers and carpenters, and I actually I spoke with a couple of people that are in the construction business, and they would love to be able to apprentice these kids and you know some kids just aren't college ready and will never be college ready they work with their hands and these are good jobs these are good positions and i'm hoping that with mfma and other um, entities that are at the state house and we're all working together whomever that may be that we can open up and make those apprentice positions easier so that we can send our hard-working kids out into the workforce. I mean, there's always going to be people in the tourism restaurant industry. There's going to be people in the construction industry. And you need good math skills to do that type of stuff. But you can get that in your high school. And you can, if we could send kids out, I think of our local automotive places, and they're seeing a hard time hiring as well. And if these people that are the baby boomer, boomers right now that are getting ready to retire, I'm sure that they would love, if they could, with less red tape, to be able to pass their skills on to other individuals that want to learn. Sometimes hands-on is the best. I think it's also a logistical um, problem because I think in terms of helping kids to access those apprenticeships, you know, I mean, you're technically talking about and, and just reality-based physically getting kids from one part of the state to the other. I mean, how do you make that happen? You know, I've often just dreamed of the day when we'll have, you know, Amtrak service, you know, up into the county. Um, but literally, what a difference that would make, you know, in terms of tourism, you know, just, you know, instead of people driving eight hours, you know, you could hop a train, you know, it sounds simplistic, but I think it's also something to be looked into in terms of how do we start connecting the state and so that we're sharing the resources, you know, we certainly, I think, have, you know, many resources down here that uh, people in the northern regions of the state could, you know, benefit from and, and certainly in terms of um, what they could offer in terms of workforce, um, you know, and, and their skills in that region um, share with us. So I would just like to see some emphasis on being able to perhaps better connect within the state and tap into the rich resources we have here. So, and I don't know if that's ever part of the discussion, but it's, to me it's a logistical issue too. Rail comes up every year. Um, they've got a pretty strong advocate or two um, for rail and dress. And, One of my insurance. Yeah. For the next one. When I was a kid, we took the train from outside Bangor to uh, um, from Monson, I think, uh, to Montreal. Montreal. Yeah. 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 Brownville. Right, Brownville. Yeah. 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 Well, you look at where the train travel was, you know, in this country. I mean, and you look at particularly a state like Maine, you know, just in terms of, um, you know, what a large state it is. And, um, you know, not to have to rely totally on either air traffic or um, driving. So, I don't know. I would just, I would love to see some emphasis on train travel and just sort of furthering the development of realize. Get some cars off the board. Yeah. Well, I think it has multiple benefits, yeah. I mean, just that alone, just the pollution aspect, the you know, ability for kids who are growing up in the county to 
you know, come down into, you know, this neck of the woods and tap into, you know, the multiple jobs that are available down here um, so they don't have to go out of state. You know, I just think there are a lot of benefits to it. And sometimes it really is, you know, quite frankly, a logistical issue. Don't let them hear that up there. They, they've got <laughs> serious short workforce shortages up there. I have a friend who's an attorney up there who put out a pitch on Facebook the other day for, um, uh, they're just having a real problem finding attorneys. Um, <coughs> serving up there and what happens is that if you only have a few yeah. then they all get a conflict of interest before you know it um, with the clients yeah. and uh and she said that uh she takes every friday off um and, and that you know most attorneys she knows in, yeah. in big cities don't have that luxury yeah. um, and so that, um, yeah. but, but, it really was but i think it's also reciprocity i mean i think there's certainly a lot of people you know who would love to spend more time up there because it's you know it's a great part of the state but you know who wants to drive eight hours, you know, to get up there. Anyway, yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I probably could do it if we don't. From here to Madawaska. You have to down to a sign. People are 90 now, right? <laughs> yeah. Pretty close. It was always 90 up there. Yeah. 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 Well, Ms. Afton, we have a clock. Is, uh, we're going for about an hour and a half. Is uh, you know, is uh, don't want to let this go too long. Is uh, but um, any further questions or comments for? I just yeah. had one question in terms of the, the legislative, the assembly legislative committees. Is that posted on the website in terms of you know what members are on each one of? We, it, it's on the legislature's website. Okay. Uh, they've got, um, and, and we've got a link to it on our website. Okay. Um, we are revamping our website to make our section of the website to make it a little more user friendly. So hopefully, by the time the next session starts, uh, that link will be a little bit easier to find. Yep. And uh, and then if you go to it now, you know it's probably dated because the, the 128th legislature has adjourned. So um, you probably want to look um, okay. once the new. Do you, when will that be? Like late December, maybe when the committee assignments are announced, yes. something like that. Um, and you can find out who's on which committee and, and whether you've got um, you know local clout on the committee that you're interested in, or um, either way, you've got your senators and uh, who cover bigger areas. And um, yeah, that's a good question. You said that one of the committees that uh, you directly are an advocate on uh, deal with this energy. The utilities. Uh, can you give us any kind of updates on solar, CMP, uh, anything happening? I don't know. I think Tom was trying to head that down. <laughs> That's a, that is a whole uh, can of worms. That, um, or there's, I mean, they're just broad uh, topic areas that um, there's a lot of debate um, on you know, which types of energy should be subsidized and which should not. Uh, and then Central Maine Power has had a whole host of, you know, they've had, I think they've even, even admitted they've had a long year, um, to put it mildly. So, um, uh, but that uh, currently the chair, uh, you've got, you know, a member of the committee here, a uh, um, former member of the committee, and hopefully, I don't know if you're interested in serving on that committee again in the future or not, but. Uh, I love that committee. Yeah. It's, it's deep. I, I can talk to you about these issues for. Yeah. Days on end. Yeah. And, uh, which we we'll, save I, I, we'll save that for another. We'll save that for another session. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, current <laughs> Senator Bootsom uh, from uh, you know just near here. I think he's from uh, right. Waterboro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. uh, he he's been the Senate chair on the committee too. And, um, yeah, I'd say stay tuned. I think on a lot of the policy areas um, with with a new legislature and a new governor. Um, Whatever's happened in the past might, um, there's no telling whether that will carry forward or whether there will be a whole different approach or um, whatnot. And, uh, so, so I wouldn't even, based on what I've seen, I wouldn't venture to make predictions on what's going to happen in a few months. I think the, uh, it's pretty clean slate and, and oh, no bets are off right now yet. So. Um, is you know, planning for our next meeting is uh, I would suggest maybe wait until you know sometime towards the end of January, and then the new legislature will be in session. We'll know who our representatives are and a uh, better idea of what's going on. And uh, so and, uh, we'll just keep in touch until then. Sounds That's good. Right. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Staying in the next stuff, I thought. Yeah. Bye. Sure.